Hey guys, in today's video, we will be talking about signals. Signals are a feature in Godot, which are just so powerful. They are very easy to use with GDScript. I'm not so sure how you do use those with C Sharp, but I don't use C Sharp with Godot anyway, even though I love it. Signals are we can hear that signals are the implementation of the observer pattern, but honestly, they are a way better implementation of that pattern if you compare this to autoloads, which are supposed to be the implementation of the singleton pattern. And I'm going to say it again, autoloads are terrible singletons. So yeah, signals, on the other hand, are very, very useful. They are super flexible. They are very effective and they make optimization very easy, very, very easy on some aspects. So first, let's just talk a little bit about what they do exactly and how they can help you. Signals, in a way, allow you to create bridges with an in point and an out point. And those bridges are kind of, I don't want to say um, they are logicless, but the way you set them up, it actually allows you to get a lot of flexibility and scalability for your projects. And it's very powerful. So you usually use signals by creating those two entry points, this in point and this out point. Based on how you will use the signal, you might need to use only, I mean, to connect only one side because the other side is somehow automatically connected. But anyway, there are different, we could say levels to use signals in Godot, but basically they are all beginner level. There's no complexity in using signals at all. First, the first way and you will use signals is by using already existing signals from nodes. And with the editor, you will just connect those signals to your script, right? That's the first way to create signals. The second way to update signals is to create custom signals, basically. So you can, in a script, create a custom signal, which doesn't exist in the base implementation of Godot. And then again, with the editor, you can connect it somewhere else. This can be useful when you're working in a complex scene and everything you're working with is embedded in the same scene encapsulated, sorry. And the most complex way of using signals really is using signals, custom signals, alongside um, cross scene behaviors, right? Like with the single time, for example. So I'm going to show you a typical behavior well, let's start, no, actually let's start, sorry, with the typical signal that you would see everywhere and which could be the first signal you have used yourself. So here we will get a label and a button. Label and button are like the, the first things people do on games usually. So let's have this button in the middle sized 320.80 and that's going to be the click me that's going to be the click me button well let's save the scene since i add this automatic save control s ocd and that's prototype okay so right here we have the button and the label i will stick it to the top give it a 80 pixel header large, I guess. 
and center center. So here I will say nothing happened yet. And what I will do is create a script for the button, very simple, built-in label script. And I will grab a signal emitted when we click on the button, okay? So here on the editor, you have this node tab on the right section where you can find the signals, right? You have the groups and the signals. And right there, you have all the lists of the base signals used by Godot in general. So we're just gonna grab the pressed signal here. We're gonna right click on it to connect. And we have this little helper that asks us, where do you want your signal to go? So you choose the node with the script that will receive the connection and you connect it. So essentially based on what I told you earlier, What's happening here is that here you have the button and you have a lot of out connections for signals, right? So you right click on it, you connect it and you say, I will define what function is going to be the in point of the signal. And here we ask the editor to create this on button pressed method to be the in output of the signal. So we don't really have to care about when the signal is emitted because that's already encapsulated in that button node, right? So anyway, here, now that we have this little method here, we can just change the text of the label to be equal to button was clicked. Okay. So if I run this scene, I can click on the button and that signal is going to go from the button here to the in point of the label to trigger the method. That's the first simplest way. Now, let's say something different. Imagine that you want the text to change if the button has been pressed three times. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna show you different ways to do that so that you can understand why the signals are very powerful. So let's disconnect this, disconnect all, and have this um, update method, which is gonna say text equal button was pressed three times. Okay, we have a few bad ways to do that. I mean, they're not bad necessarily, but they are less clear and not easily understandable and less scalable, right? But if you do that, I mean, if you have the idea of doing it this way, you're a beginner programmer, it's very fine, right? Like you need to find um, solutions before you can find optimized solutions, just so we're clear. So let's say that you create a variable, which is gonna be uh, button, button click, it, it's gonna be an int and it start at zero. And then you go here, you take that press signal, and you have this little thing in there, which is button click plus equal one. And if button click is equal to three, I want to update the text, okay? This way I can go in there, click three times, and the text is changing. I'm actually gonna duplicate this prototype so we can keep track of everything happening here. So we will have prototype two. Let's open prototype two. In this one, I will do things differently. I will remove this signal here. I will remove this logic here, here. 
and I will just keep the update method. And instead, since we remove the signal, whoops, I want to disconnect it actually, I did like this. And here I will create a script in the button, which is going to be the button script. And I will actually use the press signal again, because, well, I will just use the press signal in the button, like this. And I will do exactly the same, like button click, uh, it's going to be an int equal to zero. Right there, we will button click plus equal one. And if button click is equal to three, I want to get node. And here, I guess we want to do this or this. How can I grab this? Let me think. I will just use a unique name. It's going to be easier. Um, here, I will access label as, well, I guess I usually don't like this, but anyway, let's have this update method. That should work. I think that works. I, I rarely do this, but let's see. One, two, three. Yes, it's okay. It works. And now we will do it a third time with the custom signal this time. So let's duplicate this to be prototype three. And open it. What we're going to do is have this update method like this. All right. And uh, I need to remove this signal. Like this, I will make the button unique. Well, actually, no, I don't need to. I, don't know uh, I will just create a script hold button, just like the other one. So button, I will use the pressed signal of the button here. And what I'm going to do is var button click int equal to zero. Unpressed, I want to button click plus equal one, and if button click is equal to three, here I want to emit a signal. But which one? Well, let's create one simply by using the signal keyword by saying button clicked three times. So here I declare the signal, which appears when you save, and it should appear somewhere. It's not appearing. That's weird. And did blog after it. Or maybe actually I just wasn't able to save since the beginning. But anyway, can I can I do it without the class name? Oh, actually it works. Okay, so never mind. I actually, it was just the if statement blocking the save. Let's ignore this. We are learning from all the mistakes. That's cool. So anyway, here we have the signal button clicks three times. And what we want to do is just refer to the signal like this. And we want to use emit. All the signals have a built-in emit method that you can call to create a signal emission. Now that we emit the signal, we just have to connect it to the label like this so that the label can grab the signal to update. Okay, so now I'm going to review all these three approaches so that we can see exactly why you want to be using the signal on the end. In the first approach, what we're doing basically is that there is no logic in the button and all the logic is contained within 
the uh, let's let's close just everything to be a bit clearer. Right, we have all the logic contained in this label here. What is very weird is that if you think about it, the role of a label is to display things. When you display, I mean, the role of the label is not to keep track of how many times the button was clicked, right? I don't want to say it doesn't make sense because you can see why you want to put this here, obviously. But my point is, why should a label, which is a node created to display text, why is this node responsible for counting the amount of time a button was clicked? Does that even make sense? So my problem with this approach is that the calculation and everything regarding the button being clicked is located in the label. And that doesn't make sense to me. The second approach, let's close everything and open the scripts. Here, the label is successfully responsible for itself. So that's great, right? The label is here to display some text and it is just changing the text. All good. Now, as for the button right there, what's happening is that we do have the calculation of the amount of time the button is clicked. So, you might argue that, well, a node, a button node, is just here to create signals from the button. Why is there the calculation of how many times the button was clicked? And I guess I would agree, because in a real project, that wouldn't be in the button here, but in a script on the side, which would be a script holding the brain of the game. But at the very least, it's doing the calculation for itself, right? So maybe you could have the exact same thing in the label, like the label was updated three times and it would kind of make sense that the label would keep track of how many times it was clicked itself, right? So here, um, the button is keeping track of how many times it was clicked itself, so it's okay. But there's just a problem. The problem is that in order to update the label here, we actually coupled this behavior by requiring two things. We require an access to the receiver of the instruction, and we actually have to create lines for every receivers of the information. So let's say that I just do this. Now, if I want all the labels to update based on the behavior of button being clicked three times, I basically have to, well, do this. And that, on the long run, is very tedious. And then, let's say that I don't know, maybe you want to change the name of this method right there. You want to change the name of update. So it's already tedious to make on the first time. And then if you want to update it and maintain it, it gets very crazy. What's actually, I don't want to say bad, but what's what could be better in this situation is that the button node, which has the, the behavior there, it is actually responsible, sort of, for the behavior of the label. And the, the label is also kind of responsible for the behavior of the button, right? They are, they are coupled, basically. Now, if you look at the third prototype in there, what do we have? We have two scripts. So there's quite a lot, right? There's more scripts than 
uh, on the first one, for example, or the second one, I guess. But the idea is that even though there's a little bit more scripts, the logic behind it makes much more sense. So let's see what we have. We have the label here, which should be only responsible for displaying things. And it does. It does update the button. And here, actually, it's not really um, taking care of controlling something that's not owned by the label. Instead, what the label is doing is saying, I'm listening. That's only what this method says, I'm listening. So it's fine. The I'm listening is part of the behavior of the label, of the node. Here in the button, we still keep track of the button clicks. So the button keeps track of itself, it's perfect. And then the button actually created a signal, which is I've been clicked three, three times. And here, the main difference is that basically the button says, I don't care who is using the signal. I just, I've been clicked three times and I emit a signal saying, I've been clicked three times. The button says that out loud, out loud in the script and it doesn't care at all what the rest of the code is doing with that. So basically you could have 20 labels listening to that signal. We'd have other scripts listening to that signal, as well as nobody could be listening to that signal. And whatever the case would be, the script of this button wouldn't change a bit, because even if you have 20 labels being connected, this is still controlled by a single signal emission. That sounds weird, single signal in the way. So we actually decoupled those two scripts here. We decoupled those so that they are actually, they can be changed on their own and they're going to be fine, right? Here I can change the update to update text and I just need to update the label right? I'm not gonna break my button by changing something in the label, which would happen here and which would happen not here, but yeah, <laughs> anyway. So yeah, that's pretty much of the end of my demonstration of why you want to be using signals a lot. They helped decoupling things lot. They helped maintaining lots. <laughs> so yeah. Now that we have done this, we have basically seen how we use signals with the editor. Often you don't need more than this. And it's very fine. Often the editor alone is definitely enough. Sometimes you are, you, you find yourself in situations where you basically have scenes communicating with other scenes. And in that kind of situation, you can always create, um, I don't know, you can always create this kind of uh, connections and awareness of the parents, right? So you always have this opportunity when you instance a new node to have the parent telling the child node, hey, I'm giving you my reference so that you can use my reference to get a reference to the signal that exists wherever. That, that, that could work, but the ideal way, really, if you want my two cents on that, is to hate autoloads and use singleton. So here, let's just create a typical manager. 
so that we can see how the signal can be created with the custom signal and how it can be grabbed. So you probably probably already know this if you have watched my series, but let's go anyway. Maybe let's consider you haven't. So here we're gonna create this. Um, yeah, let's create a new subfolder. Let's be organized a little bit. Gold manager. We have the gold manager. We extend nodes. I didn't talk about this yet. Why? Oh, I'm a lame. Okay, I'm in the prototype. My bad. I was editing the wrong script. Uh, yeah, class name, goal manager. What was I saying? I was saying nodes are dependent, signals are dependent on the node code. So if you want to use signals in a script, you need to extend node. And that's important because I think I tried once to have signals in resources basically, and that ended up poorly. So I'm going to show you one thing, okay? Uh, let's make this a singleton. So we have a static variable ref being gold manager, and we have the enter tree as usual being my if ref q3 return and if not ref equals self so we do have a single part okay i have tons of errors that will just delete this no type goodbye here let's say that you have your variable gold like this and let's initialize it to zero. Let's say that you have your method to create gold. So you're going to have this method like this. You want an argument, obviously, to be the quantity of gold you want to generate. And then you want to have gold plus equal quantity. Now, in the prototype that doesn't exist anymore, don't say, I'm going to create another one instead. So let's have this prototype saved in the prototype folder. Uh, in this prototype right there, I will have a label at the top still. Whoops. Label it said at the top and have the inspector layout 80 pixels yeah yeah i know i deleted it but my error messages were getting out of hands and here no that's the center center i want okay and basically here we have two scenes right we have the goal manager and we have the prototype we want those scenes to communicate with each other so what i'm going to do is create a signal. Well, let's not start by talking about the signal yet, but let's have this label here, label script. I want to have the update uh, method that will say text is going to be equal to gold with the value of gold being manager. Well, I put gold manager. I made a mistake. My bad. That's filming two videos in a row and being late I mean in a day so anyway we have the update method and when we want to what we want to do is basically call it on ready like this so the point is if I create a more realistic game node like this, have it saved in its own game files. And then I grab both my manager and my prototype, right? If I start this, I will have the goal being displayed properly, thanks to the singleton pattern that we've seen in the previous video. 
But right now, the problem is that if I do increase the, let's say that I have in my prototype, I have a timer. Let's create a timer node. Let's have this timer node get a script, a script timer. And in that script, the timer node basically, when it times out, it will generate a few goal, right? So here, goal manager dot ref dot create goal, and I will create one every time this auto start lib or um, timer will run out. So now what will happen is I start the game, gold is being created, right? If I go in there and I go in game and I go in goal manager, uh, we can see that gold is being created. So how exactly do we do that? Well, we could use all the kind of weird tricky things that I did on the prototype one and two, but I want both my label or my prototype scene to be decoupled from my goal manager scene. So that's why we're gonna create uh, in my goal manager right there, I'm gonna create a signal gold created with a quantity argument. Let's not talk about arguments yet. Let's have this go created like that. Then we need to emit the signal. So I could just like, you know, show you, well, actually it's gonna be like this. Um, here, we're gonna have this little thing, go created uh, dot emit, I guess. That's a great thing. Because now I can basically grab on the signal. I can grab on the signal by creating a connection and saying on goal created and have a date happening. All I need to do, because I can't use the editor, right? I can go in my goal manager in node, I can use the connect to find the prototypes node because they are different scenes. That's the problem. So that's when we actually need to use the connect method of a signal to create that connection that we usually do through right click connect, but with the script. So here, in the ready method, I will just go find the goal manager and find the signal. So I can use the connect method instead of the emit method, right? So you have the in and out connections. And here I will just name the method I wanna connect. So the auto completion gives you those parentheses. It's a little bit sad because you have to get rid of it, but now it's perfectly connected. So I guess we can start the game and we will have the label updating every second. And we can change the manager, we can change the prototype. It's always gonna work fine because they are decoupled, right? But that's redundant with what I was saying earlier. Okay, now let's try something a little different. Let's have another label, all right? Let's have another label. And this one will basically show you how much gold, what am I doing? How much gold was generated in the last instance. Okay. So I'm gonna stylize this slightly. So center, center, layout, 80 pixels and header large. So this guy will actually receive an argument. Uh, let's create a script for it, label two. So the update function of this will actually take a quantity argument. And what I'm gonna do is have this 
created Bayou Gold and that sends Goal Manager dot ref and oh no actually I need quantity. What am I doing? All right. Now that I have this, I will you know wait a second. Let's update the, the signal first maybe. I will just remove this at the moment. And I will update the signal to take an argument quantity. So when I emit the signal, uh, to be fair, this right there, it's not necessary. But it's important in my opinion because it reminds people who read the code, hey, <laughs> this signal has an argument. And it's very important because you want to take the arguments in when you take them out. Otherwise, it's going to be doing very tricky things. So here, when I create gold, what I'm going to do instead is have this thing emit the signal with the argument quantity, right? So if I go back in my prototype, whoops, go in my label two, I will create this function on gold created with a quantity argument, and that's very important. Even if you're not using the argument and you're discarding the argument, you want to have it in the method. And what you're going to do is just update with quantity, right? And as usual, you want your function on ready to connect to the signal, game manager ref, go created, and here you want to connect, and you just need to reference the method. You don't need to take care of the argument right there. Okay. So now, with the current behavior, I should be able to see how much go was created in the last instance. So just so we have this to be a little, bit, a little bit more visual, we will instead generate a range, a random number of calls between two and five, right? So we should see this changing, right? Okay. Now let's just fix this label thing, this first label. So we have two ways, really, to do this. Uh, where is it? Actually, I don't need it. I just need to go to the script. So the first way is to, as I said, create a buffer. So you will have this on go created with a quantity argument that will be discarded. And here you want to update. Okay. And right there, what you want to do is go manager dot ref all created connect to on go created. So if we do this, again, the goal should update there as usual, and we just discard this value. Okay, I'm going to show you what happens when you don't discard it like this. Basically, it will give you an error. Yeah, as you can see in the debugger, here, there's a signal created and it's the, the problem with arguments. So that's the dangerous side of signals, right? You have to be very careful. And this mistake of forgetting the signals, I did it a lot at the beginning, right? It took time to sink in. It's all right, it's normal. Now I do think about it more often and it's way more rare for me to forget about it. But anyway, there's just one thing, if you really think about it. Now let's just think that we upgrade this and create this method. Consume gold. And again, we will have quantity and int. And 
I will not do the checks like if quantity is superior to gold, blah, blah, blah. We'll just have gold minus equal quantity. So right there, I'm going to create a new signal, right? Which is going to be signal gold consumed. And again, have an argument quantity. And I will call this signal here, gold consumed. Dot emit with quantity. Okay, question now. What do we do? How do we do this? We have the way of saying, basically, I want my label right there, the first one. I want it to have a new connection, which is going to be on gold consumed. And here I need my argument quantity. And I need my argument quantity here as well. On gold consumed, I want to update. All right. That's the way. All right, to do that. But you see, again, that could be a little weird because you could have this kind of accumulations of signals happening and you accumulate the signals in and in and in and in. Do you really wanna do this? Like have all these lines accumulating? Probably not. Sometimes it's not, right? Because on the um create consume you just have the positive and the negative behaviors and you're done right so it's okay but you you can just you know have the things to be a little bit different sometimes creating more signals can be handy right if we go back to the goal manager and decide to create a new signal being goal updated we can now emit this signal which says, well, either gold was created or consumed or whatever, but gold changed, right? You have two ways to do that. The first one is to, well, have gold dated to be emitted there as well as there. Gold dated. Whoops. I don't know. Gold updated. Got emit. So that's a way which works very fine. Another way is to use uh, getters and setters, right? So you can add a little bit of logic right there in this gold um, variable. So you add a column and you add a set value. And here, Let me just type it and explain to you what this is. What this does basically is that it allows you to add logic to the action of assigning a new value to gold, right? So basically think about this method as being set gold with an argument value, okay? You don't need to type value because it's typed right there. And here, think about the method that runs when you do gold equal. And when you say somewhere gold equal, etc., etc., you will go through this method. So the base set value is always gold is going to be equal to value. So right here, this is the same as this. But what I'm doing is just I'm typing it so I can extend it. And once the value has changed, I can emit the signal gold updated dot emits. Okay. I never tried it, but based on my latest experiments, this should work very fine. And I'm quite confident, so I'm filming it right now. So what I will do is get rid of those two methods and here have on goal updated instead of on goal created or consumed. 
So on goal updated, I want to update. And here, I want to grab the goal updated signal and connect to on goal updated. Right. So let's start this again. And as you can see, we have those two signals working independently. And this signal here is actually triggering when, where is it? There, when the goal value is being updated. So this is kind of cool, not gonna lie. All right. Just so you know about the way of saying things, sort of. Signals are the implementation of the observer pattern. So the observer pattern usually we separate different cases, different scenarios based on the multiplicity of listeners. So we make the difference between scenarios where we have one listener or one emitter and multiple listeners or multiple emitters. And that is coming in the form of using the opposition of always two words. You have either one and many or one to n, n being the meaning of many. And with that, you can make some combinations, if you wish. So you can have one to one signals. You can have one to many signals. Or you can have many to one signals. And again, many to many signals. So based on those relationships, you will use your signals differently. Here, goal created in and of itself, it is a one to many relationship, right? Because there will always be one source of goal being created. And a lot of people will care about knowing that. Same for goal consumed, one to many. Goal updated, However, it's a little bit different, right? You have this thing of, I could have multiple sources. I'm gonna show you a different way uh, to have multiple sources. That's a little, a little bit heavier, I guess, but you see, I, the last time I created this uh, emit there, so you can just multiply the emit um, sources. Well, what you can do is let's have this alternative goal updated. And what you will do is on ready functions. Honestly, here right now, I'm kind of going YOLO because I, I never had a situation where I wanted to do this, but maybe you will. So I will just put that there. And if you use it in one of your projects, well, great. You could have um, basically, how am, I, how am I gonna put this? Goal consumed dot connect, and you wanna connect. So can I create empty methods like this? Like alternative gold, no, uh, I can't remember how you create anonymous method. So I'm just going to create a emit alternative called updated. So here I will have gold updated dot emit. So you will have this and you want to connect go consume to emit like this and then have go created dot connect emit alternative go etc. And you can actually add a lot of connections like this. So you will pretty much connect a signal to a signal. I don't know if that makes sense, if that's any useful. Maybe it will. I don't know. I wanna I wanna talk about this so maybe someone will need it. 
if we just go back and visualize in our head what was happening, when we usually use buttons, we use a one-to-one -one relationship most of the time. And in fact, you know how, if you've been following my content for a while, you know that when I'm using a signal, I usually always use buffer methods, right? Like this. Some people would argue that it's, this method is not necessary to have on goal updated right there. It's useless. You could just connect directly to update, right? Because the only thing this method does is invoke update. So why not just have update there? Well, that's because I it helps me to have the uh, observer pattern to be clearer in my head, right? At the same time, if it's clearer to me, it should be clearer to other people reading it. Of course, right now, I don't have many people reading my code or actually, I want to say, updating it. So it's pretty much future me who is concerned about reading and understanding the code because when you watch a video, I'm explaining in live what I'm doing. And if you disagree, you can just do it differently. So it's very fine. But yeah, you get my point, right? I, I, it, if it's clearer in my head and it shouldn't be confusing, it doesn't add confusion. confusion. It adds, um, I don't know how I want to put this, but it's longer. It takes more time to type, but it doesn't create chaos and confusion to the person who reads it. They may be questioning why not just do something shorter and the reason is easier to read. So anyway, that's way too long to explain that simple point anyway. So I think I'm done with explaining signals. And to be honest, I thought that signal video would be short and be done in like a few minutes. And it's absolutely not because the more I was going, I was thinking, oh, I must say that, I must say, say, say this. <laughs> and anyway, so that was supposed to be an intro episode and actually it's gonna be an intermediate because of the duration, right? And I really want people to understand that this is not just a, hey, to make signals, you use the emit and connect method, goodbye. <laughs> right that's, that's what you do, right? You have a pattern and you're not just here to use it in a very simplistic way. You really want to be creative with this pattern. You want to create structures which are easy to understand and optimize in a way. So, yep, yep, yep. Anyway, that's all for me for this video. Hope you liked it. I am actually I'm very satisfied with this video, way much more than the single time one. And yeah, I will see you in the next video and you take care. Goodbye.